Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam Nasser, and this is the Azure Cleveland User Group. A little bit about the group. We meet every second Wednesday. The meetings are free of charge and open to the public. And we cover a variety of topics related to Azure, whether it's infrastructure as a service or platform as a service or software as a service. You can find meeting information posted at the Meetup site for both past as well as future meetings at the link listed at the bottom of the slide. As always, I'd like to give a big thank you to our sponsors, uh, PostSharp and DevExpress, for sponsoring the post-meeting prizes. Uh, these will be raffled off using the eval forms, which will be made available. We'd also like to give a big thank you to the .NET Foundation for sponsoring the Meetup page and NIS Technologies for sponsoring the virtual meeting space. In addition, a big thank you to Manning.com for a 35% off offer on a selection of books uh, with the link listed at the bottom of the slide. This link, as well as other links, will be posted in the chat window in just a few moments. And some general information. First and foremost, please keep in mind participation is encouraged. So the only stupid question is the one not being asked. However, when not speaking, kindly ask you to mute your microphones just to avoid any background noise. And we always like to keep it casual but organized, so jump in at any point in time with a question or a comment. However, uh, we want to give our speaker enough time to go through the, the slides and the demos. Lastly, the presentation is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube in just a few short days. And with a link, will be made available in the chat window as well. So for tonight's feature presentation, we have David Giard discussing data deep dive with um, Azure Data Explorer and Custo Query Language. David is a cloud solution architect with Microsoft. He has over two decades of uh, application development experience, and he's a frequent speaker at various conferences, code camps, and user groups worldwide. He's also the host and producer of uh, shows like Technology and Friends and Gcast. And he's also the author of RealWorld.net, C Sharp, and Silverlight, which I hear is a little bit outdated, but uh, we won't get into that. <laughs> And lastly, you can also follow David at davidgr.com to check out his latest blog posts. And so with that, let me turn it over to David, and I'll make you presenter. First, enough about you, a little bit about me. My name is David. Uh, Sam already said that I am a cloud solution architect. I've been working with Microsoft almost 10 years. And if you want to follow me online, there's a couple of links right there of content that I'm creating, absolutely free for your enjoyment and education. Um, this is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, what is Azure Data Explorer? Uh, it is a, I'll tell you right now, it's a database. Um, there's a lot of databases out there. They're not all appropriate for all situations. I'll talk a little about when is ADX or Azure Data Explorer appropriate, uh, how, to, how to use it, how to create these clusters, databases, tables, views, and so on, um, using some of the, the command line tools. And then I'll dive into Custo Query Language, sometimes abbreviated KQL. Uh, we'll start with the basics, and then we'll talk uh, about using time series data. That's what's really, it's really good for time series data. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the ge geography functions in KQL, which are really cool. We, I used that on a project last year, um, and materialized view. And then I'll also explain why there is a picture of a diver on every one of these slides. All right, Azure Data Explorer. I said it's a database. Uh, it's been out in general release for uh, about three years now, I think. Um, and uh, it seems kind of funny that Microsoft would come up with another database. They've got SQL Server. They've got uh, Cosmos DV. They've got all these other databases that are available. And, you know, why come up with other other one? And the reason is because it's really optimized for massive amounts of data storage. If you want to have terabytes, petabytes of data and be able to query that very quickly in near real time, and you want to work with both structured, un unstructured, and semi-structured data, then ADX is perfect for that. It's also as it's deployed to Azure, so uh, like all services on Azure, it's very scalable, and like almost all services on Azure, it's it's a managed service, which means that the the maintenance of the service itself is abstracted away from you. You can focus on just creating tables, adding data to those tables, querying them, things like that. The things that are core to your business, as opposed to you know making sure the hardware is running, making sure the operating system is running, making sure that the the, the software is patched, things like that. All right. Um, 
ADX is not for everything. Um, there are other databases out there. Essentially, it's what I said in the last slide. It's the, the, for massive scalability um, with um, uh, fast, near real-time responses. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles that come with SQL Server. There isn't, for example, if you want to do a data warehouse with star schemas, ADX doesn't do that. If you want to do things like uh, oh, uh, integration with uh, Azure Data Factory, things like that, it doesn't have that built in, those tools built into it. It's uh, it's really designed just for storing lots of data. So it's great for logs or IoT data. It's really good for if you're storing small bits of data, but lots and lots of records. You know, IoT data tends to be like that. You know, you have, I want to read this machine. I want to get the temperature and the speed of the machine three times a minute. And that's a small bit of data, but I want that to go be coming constantly. And I've got 10,000 machines running all over the world. I want to get all that information into my database in the cloud. Um, I said earlier that it's, it's only been in general release for two or three years, but it's actually been around a lot longer than that. Internally, Microsoft has been using this product as part of their backend services. So some of the things that are managed inside of Azure SQL Database are actually using ADX. Um, every time you go into a tool like Office and that little thing pops up that says, do you want to provide feedback or you know, send telemetry data back to Microsoft so we can make the product better, that data is going back to Azure Data Explorer. If you go into Azure Monitor and use a tool like Application Insights or some of the other tooling, all that data is being captured inside of ADX. And it has for a long time. So this is these are huge amounts of data that are being stored there. And Microsoft internally has been pounding on this for a while. So even when version 1.0 came out, uh, it has still been really well tested. It was a very stable product right from the very beginning of its general release. There's a bunch of customers that are using ADX right now. It's uh, maybe you probably, probably don't care less about that. You want to know how it works. Let me jump into that. Um, this is the concept that if you're working with a tool like SQL Server or one of these other uh, enterprise databases, you should know, see something very similar to this. We start with a cluster. We create a that's the managed service itself, ADX cluster, and within that cluster we can create one or more databases. And inside of each database we can create one or more tables, and we can also create things like functions, which are a lot like stored procedures in SQL Server, or views, which also exist in SQL Server. And um, let me talk, and here's how, here's how you do it. Here's how you do it in the portal. You can, of course, there's a CLI command, so you can do this as well, but in the portal, creating a cluster is very simple. A little dialog that pops up. It looks a lot like almost every other service that you're going to create in Azure. You assign it to, you select your subscription, you assign it to a resource group. Um, resource group is just a way of organizing a bunch of similar things together, uh, letting Azure know, let you know that they're all related together. Um, the name of the cluster, of course, that has to be unique because you're going to manage it with that. What region it's going to be in, when you do that, you want to think about, oh, what's, uh, you know, what services are interacting with this, who's querying it, what's, who's writing to it. You want to minimize the latency, so keep it close to that. Um, and uh, for the workloads, there's some optimization things you can tell it whether you're doing a lot of reading or a lot of writing, and then uh, the size of the machine. Of course, more bigger machines cost more per hour than smaller machines, and so on. So that's creating a cluster. Once you create a cluster, you can create a database that's even simpler. The one unusual thing you might see here is there is a retention period. It'll delete this after a certain number of days, but if you want to, you can have it archived somewhere into something like storage, cold storage for that, and uh, a time to keep things in cache. So anything in the, in the cache will actually query a lot, lot faster. And finally, the creating a table. You can create a table through the interface right here, or you can create it through the command line. And this is typically what I'll use. I'll use things like dot create table. All the ADX commands start with dot, and uh, dot create merge table. That's if the table already exists and you want to create it if it doesn't exist. That sort of thing. Dropping tables, altering columns, renaming columns. There's all sorts of syntax for uh, you know data definition language syntax for managing tables in here. There's an example of it right there, but I've got some demos I'm going to show you in a few minutes. Uh, ingesting data, um, if you want to get data into ADX, there's a bunch of possibilities. Here's a few of them. One, you can pull it directly into, I didn't need to do that. I meant to do that. Uh, uh, from uh, Azure Storage, so if you've got something in Azure Table Storage or Azure Blob Storage, and you want to bring it into ADX to work with it there, there's a command for doing that. 
you, know, you can also query other tables within ADX and merge them into a single table. Um, this is a really common thing if you have something going into an event hub. This would be a great example if you have IoT information. The project that I worked on last year was where we had some self-driving vehicles, and we want to track the location of those vehicles and the velocity of those vehicles. And so we're sending information to an event hub, and then Azure Data Explorer was pulling that information out of the event hub and populating it near real time. And then you can also, there's a command just to say dot ingest inline, and you can just hard code. If you just have a few records to do it, then you can do it like this as well. So there's lots of options for getting data into it, depending on whether it's a batch process, you want to load a whole, preload a bunch of data, or whether it's something that's ongoing, like an event hub might be better for if you want to have uh, data coming in constantly. Okay, no slides for now. Let's jump over to a demo right here. Um, I'll hit, I'll go to, let me go do this. I'll go to portal.azure.com. So I have an Azure account. I click on create a resource and I can just search for that resource ADX. If I just do that, it'll come up with Azure Data Explorer. Create a new Azure Data Explorer. And this will create a cluster right here. And here's the sub dial. I showed you this on the screen before. I can select a resource group or I can create a brand new resource group like this. I'm not going to actually do it all here, but I'll I'll call this one uh let's see Cleveland cluster, uh put it in the East US. And the workload, here's what you can do. You can say whether it's optimized for essentially whether it's optimized for reading or writing, so whether you want to have the the storage optimized to write it or the compute optimized for reading it. And then if you're just learning a dev test is great, but dev test makes a small one that you can't really change this. If I do this, then I have the option of having these really large expensive things. There's no compute there. If I say compute, I also want to do, uh, oh, I guess it doesn't look, change that. All right. Uh, and then availability zones here, if you want some redundancy to copy things over in case a disaster occurs, then you can do that. All the rest of this stuff is pretty common for um, Azure Managed Services. You can have you know, auto scaling between you know two to five instances. If you have some variability, some configuration on here, whether you're gonna support streaming ingestion, you have to turn that on. Um, some security stuff, some whether you wanna use support expose it to the public, or do I want to have um, uh, private endpoints? You have an option on that. Tags, if you want to do some reporting. But when you're done, the only thing that's actually required is the stuff on the basics page. Once you're done, you click on create. And I'm not going to click on that because it takes about five minutes for it to actually create this, and I've already got one created. If I search for it, oh, there it is right there, DG Test ADX. I always name things DG, my initials, followed by test, followed by whatever it is right here. And so I've created that. And in here, if I wanted to add a new database, pretty simple, right at the top, add database. There's also an Azure CLI command that'll do this, but um, and I could give it a name, DB2, and then just the, the defaults here are fine. I don't wanna delete ever, just keep stuff forever and click on create. And that's fine right there. I'll let that go. I'm not really worried about this one because I, I actually created the database already and I called it. Where is it? Right here, database. Well, it's already done, that was fast. But I created one here called DB1, right here. And if I click on the query right here, here's where I can create tables really e easily here. And in fact, here's some of the commands to do that. Right now you'll see, if I go in here and refresh it, there's nothing in this database, it's completely empty. So I'm gonna create a table called drone data. All my demos, or some of my demos have to do with, we imagine we've got a drone flying around and we're just tracking the location of that drone. So I'll just click on run right here. And now I've created that. And you can see there's a table there called drone data. It should have those four columns in it. ID, timestamp, latitude, I'm sorry, five columns right there. Uh, if I wanna add some data to it, here's this ingest inline. So I've got about 20 or so rows in here. I click on run or I think, uh, what is it? I think it's alt enter is the shortcut key. Is that right? Maybe it's shift enter, shift enter, sorry. And we'll be able to see that there's data in here. And in fact, do this here. I'll just say, if I just type drone data, later on, I'll show you the language, the Custo query language. Right here, you can see there's those 26 rows that were added right there. 
get rid of that. Here's uh, customers. I don't have a table to drop right now, but I'm just going to just create merge. It says create it if it doesn't exist already. Uh, otherwise, update it. So let me do shift enter. Now I've got another table called customers, and it's got a first, you know, full name, last order date, year to date sales, so on on here. I'll add some customers, some data to that customers table. We've got Bill and Steve and Statia and Steve, Larry, Jeff, Tim, Steve, Scott, and me because, hey, it's my presentation. All right, so now I've got some sample tables, some sample data, and uh, I think that's the only thing I wanted to do for this demo right here. Let's do that. Let's go back to here. And this is a good time for a good review. Yay. Adjusting data, some PowerPoint foo, some demos. Ah, we're going to talk about Custo query language. And the reason it's called Custo is because it was named for Jacques Cousteau, the famous sea explorer. It's a misspelling of Jacques Cousteau so that you won't accidentally Bing with Google or Google with Bing the wrong spelling of that. And that's why there's a diver on all these slides. <laughs> Uh, Custo client query is super fast. It's really fast, especially for time series data. It's really optimized for time series data. If you've got something like, uh, and I'm creating these, this drone data that I had that was, um, you know, tracking the drones by every, you know, every few seconds. I want to send information on that. Querying that is really fast. It also has a bunch of built-in functions, just dozens and dozens of built-in functions that make it really nice. Some of which are, are make things easier in KQL than they would be in SQL because of these built-in functions. Um, it is read-only. There is no update, and that's one of the reasons it's so fast, is because it's a, essentially a read-only database. Yes, you can ingest data into it, but uh, the KQL um, is just for reading. It. There's no way to go back and update something. So there's none of this overhead of updating indexes and updating records. It's really optimized for just kind of appending at the bottom and then reading. All right, here's an example of this right here. If those of you who have used SQL or SQL before, structured query language, uh, this you should be able to read this. You know, there's the name of the table, a you know, filter, a order by, pro project is the names of the columns that you want to output, and then take is if you want to do a top end query. In this case, it'd be a bottom end because you're sorting in ascending order. But if you want to see the, the earliest 100, something like that. Um, and then it also has elements of bash script. If you've worked with bash before, you know this, you'll know this pipe character here means that you take the output of what comes before the pipe, and that'll be the input of what comes after the pipe. You can chain those together. So you take an entire table called telemetry data and filter it. And after you filtered it, then you do an order by. You take once you've ordered, oops, once you've done order by, then you do the project and get the columns. And then once you've done that, then you take 100 of it. All right, it also has these, some built-in functions specifically for time series data. The most interesting to me are the previous and the next and this summarized by Ben. I'll, I'll come back to the summarized by Ben, but previous and next are really nice because they, they let you do things like if you write a query that says, you know, I'm sorting things by time and I want to know how much has it increased since the last record. Preve is really nice. You know, How much has this drone moved? since the last record. I can look at the position from the last record and compare it to the position of the current record and actually do the math on that. Or, you know, the next as well, if I want to look into the future. Um, here's the bin part of it. This is really interesting. Uh, bin lets you, you know, you know in, in SQL, you can do things like uh, you can aggregate. You can do uh, select the average of cost. Um, it's a, using group by, group by, uh, month, something like that, or group by, uh, that's how it's a group by state. Average cost, select average cost from customer group by state and show you the average by state. Here you can group by a given time period here. So right here you see this, I'm doing this summarized by bin of timestamp one hour. So there's a column in here called timestamp, and I only want one row for every hour. Maybe I've got like 60 rows per second. So I've got hundreds and hundreds of rows per hour, but I want to, I only want to see one row per hour. And then you might ask, well, which row do I want to see? And the answer is over here. When I say summarize, I specify I want the arg max. In this case, I want the maximum timestamp. Give me the latitude and longitude, or whatever the maximum timestamp per hour is. 
Uh, I could do arg min, I could do arg average, I could do arg sum, things like that. But I can aggregate based on time, which is really interesting. And it could take, you know, if you got something like IoT data, which is collecting tons and tons of data, um, this is a really good way to aggregate that in really simple code. Um, okay, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, geography functions that are built into KQL. Geography functions are, um, KQL understands the concept of geography and polygons. And so you can do things like tell me the dis given the latitude and longitude of two points, tell me the distance between those two points. Or given a point and a polygon, tell me whether or not that point is inside or outside that polygon. So the first function does calculates distance. The second function calculates whether a true or false, whether or not something's inside or outside of a polygon. Might be great if you want to know whether or not a, uh, a delivery has been made, for example. Um, and then there's a so I'm going to come back to this later on. This is concept of S2 cells, which I just learned about when I was dealing with this, my, my last ADX project, in which you can approximate a, a position really quickly, and that can help you to, uh, to, to do your calculations a lot faster. All right, let me talk a little about the polygon functions. Here, this code right here is what will define a polygon. It happens to be a four-sided polygon with these one, two, three, four points on it. Um, I don't think it's rectangle. I think it is a rectangle, actually, I look at it, uh, but it's not a square. And um, so we turn these, these eight latitudes and longitudes into four points with this code right here, and then this pack actually will generate a polygon. This polygon variable is an object of type polygon. So with this bit of code here now, I have defined a polygon with four corners, and those four corners are at X and Y here, 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 and here. Once I have that polygon, then I, I can write KQL queries like this using geo point and polygon. This is, just returns a true or a false. So I say I've got a table, and it has a date time stamp, and it has every record has a latitude and a longitude, and I want to know whether or not, given that latitude and longitude, is it inside or is it outside of the polygon. So I, I only want I want to filter on those only those that are inside of this polygon that I created right here. And that'll return something like this. Really powerful. That'd be really hard to do in SQL. Um, I can use this inside of functions. If I want to create a function, the syntax is dot create or alter function. And we can add some metadata to that, like a description if we want to. If we can organize them into folders, it supports that. There's the name of the function. This case is called device path. Here are the arguments for the function. There's four of them. Filter device ID, start date time, end date time, and time bend length. Notice that time bend length has a default value of one hour. So that makes it optional. If I decide to only pass in three arguments to this, to this function, it will assume one hour for that fourth argument. And then finally, there's the code of the function itself. And you can see that it's writing a, a KQL query but it's um, it's using some of his arguments, the, 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 the parameters that are passed in. Like for example, the time steps between the start date time and those are variables passed in up here. And when we call it, this one I said is called device path. It's got four arguments, three of which are required, one is optional. You can call it just like this, device path. And then these three arguments, here I've, I've omitted the fourth argument, so it assumes one hour. And it just returned one record per hour with we're outputting the current lat the timestamp, current longitude, current latitude, which is what this thing is doing here. Uh, project timestamp, current long, current lat right here. Um, and we could do that with um, the, these geo functions I talked about here. This is kind of this is really nice here. So for example, I want here's a function that will return um, every, let's say I have a, a bunch of data here with timestamp and lat, latitude and longitude. Uh, I want to find only those that are inside of a given polygon. And I'll pass that polygon in as a parameter right here. So for given start date, start time and end time, find all the points that are inside of that polygon. 
And then I'm also going to only return one row per hour right here. I also filter around fleet ID, which for some reason I thought was a good idea. Um, so I can do this, and this works. But this is a really slow function. And the reason it's really flow, slow is because I'm filtering on a call to a function right here. So what's going to happen is if I have millions of rows inside of that match this filter, you know, the, the date time, where's the other part of it? The fleet ID and the timestamps between the date time and the end time, this part will be fast. But if there's still millions of rows that it's going to return, let's say I do it for a six-month period, then it has to do a table scan. It really can't index on this function. Just like a SQL Server doesn't index on a call to a function. It, ha it, it, it does its best and it filters ahead of time, but then ultimately at some point it has to do a table scan. So this can be a really, really slow query on large data sets. And that's a, this is a real world problem that we actually faced. And the way we addressed it was we created something called a materialized view. And a materialized view in KQL, it's a lot like a view in SQL Server, but it's actually persisted to disk. So every time I insert a row into, in this case, this telemetry data table, this view is will be updated. Uh, view is called telemetry data one hour bin. It's going to be updated. It'll be updated, and that, that view is based on this query right here. It's, I want to summarize by one hour timestamps, and uh, so so now I've got some summary data. If I query this, it, it might be a lot faster. And in fact, what we did, let's see, I call this one telemetry data one hour bin, and I can call that, I can query this table, or I can query this view just like I query a table. Now, instead of querying a table name, I just query this materialized view, and everything else is the same. I could filter it. I could project columns from it. KQL treats it just like it was a table. And the way, the way that we use this, oh, actually, before we use that, I, want, I need to show you one more thing. This is the S2 cells. I mentioned this earlier. I said I would come back to it. This is, this is the concept of S2 cells. S2 cells break up the, the, the world, the Earth, into rectangles of approximately equal size. These don't look like rectangles, but that's only because we flattened the globe app out onto a, a flat surface. But these are lines of latitude. These are lines of latitude right here. Um, and so these actually are rectangles when they're projected onto a globe. Um, and uh, if I click on this link right here, it explains it really well, s2geometry.io. But by the way, I'll, I'll give you the link to these slides. You don't have to um, like remember this link right here. It'll be in the slide deck. Um, and in here, that's where I stole that picture from, then you can look at, I think it's right here, yeah. So there are different levels of S2 cells. If I say level zero, then it'll divide the world up into six cells, each of which is about almost 8,000 kilometers square. And um, if I divide it at level one, it divides into 24, and level three, level, level two is 96 squares. So each one of these are smaller squares, that divide the world into more and more rectangles until we get to level 30 is the highest one. And that's, these rectangles are eight or nine millimeters across. So um, if you want, if you care a little bit less about precision, you know, depending upon your level of precision that you care about, then you can start querying on S2 cells and just determining whether or not two objects are close to each other. Sometimes that's enough. As long as you know that two objects are close to each other, maybe that's what, what you want to know. You know. Are there two planes that are about to collide? Are there two, um, um, is it, uh, if I'm dealing with uh, GPS data, are they close enough that it's the error of the GPS signal is, uh, might be inherent in it? Things like that. So it lets me get approximations really fast of where the, the location is. So that's the idea behind this here of S2 cells. And there are functions built into KQL which will calculate these S2 cells. Like, for example, it will take a latitude and longitude and, and an S2 level and tell you which cell it's in. Each cell has an ID associated with that. So there's this function right here, geo point to S2 cells. And you pass in a longitude and a latitude and a level, and it'll give a value. And those values are things like, uh, where are they here? 
just these one, two, three, four, five, six character numbers. And what it tells you is that if two numbers are the same, then they are, exist inside of the same S2 cell. So, so for example, at level nine, every single one of these is the same S2 cell. And at level uh, 15, then which has smaller cells, then these two are in the same cell and these two are in the same S2 cell. In fact, the same one is that up here. And you can see the ones that are close to each other. They get to level 21, then it looks like none of them, except for, yeah, it looks like none of them are in the same cell. It's small enough that none of them are in the same cell. The way we used it was to increase our performance is we would, we would convert to S2 cells and filter on those first. And here's, here's the example we were using here. Imagine that you had a bunch of vehicles and you wanted to know whether or not they were within a polygon. Maybe you want to know whether or not they returned to the, your city or into the, the close to the close to home or inside of the warehouse. You're tracking this information and you want to filter on that. And you can filter on that pretty easily using this, uh, you know, is in polygon, the geo, geo is in polygon function. But as I said before, that has to do a table scan. And it's possible that I don't just have these 30 or so data points. Maybe I have, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of data points. And having to scan through that would take a really, really long time. So the approach that we took was that we figured out the, there's, a, there's a function that will tell you for a given polygon, show me the S2 cells that touch that polygon. In other words, the smallest array of S2 cells that will completely cover this polygon. We did that, and then we first filtered on that, and, and then we were um, uh, able to when we did a table scan, we had a lot fewer data points to do our table scan. Let, let me show you how that works here. So we created the materialized view. In that materialized view, we calculated the S2 cell. We used level 15 here for every single point. And that now we know in our data, in our, in our view, we know what that S2 cell is. We called that view telemetry data one hour bin because we were also aggregating right here on one hour. And then um, we would query that to speed our query up. So here's our polygon right here, geo polygon to S2 cells. This right here does what I showed you before. It takes, it creates this array of S2 cells that are close to the polygon, that the, the smallest array that will cover that polygon at level 15. So we did that. Now we have this array right here. And now when we query this materialized view, we can say only show me those where the S2 cell is inside of that array. And that's a much smaller thing to do. And once we have that in devices in S2 boxes, now we can query this right here. And now we're doing a table scan still, but we're doing a table scan. We're doing a table scan of a much, much smaller data set. So there's some clever things you can do in here, things that would be really difficult in the language like SQL Server or a language like SQL because of the built-in geo functions. All right, and then I, I, this is my like little cheat sheet here that I, I kept around. Uh, materialized views can really speed things up. You find you're aggregating a lot of times over and over. Materialized views are a great way to speed up those queries. Uh, it is optimized for time series data. So you always wanna use put the time filters at the very top of your where clause. Remember, it's always the output of one thing is the input of the next thing. So the first thing you want to do is to filter on the fastest thing. And they don't want to filter on calculated columns like I did in the first example. I was trying to filter on those that were inside of a polygon. I want to figure out a way to avoid doing that as much as possible. And then and also there's case insensitive drivers. I just had that in there because yeah, it, is, it is faster to do case insensitive than case insensitive. All right. All right, that's a lot of information, but I, I, hopefully it'll come be more obvious when I show you a demo right here. So here I am back in this, and I have a bunch of data. So I've got some, I've already created a few tables, and I'm going to use those tables. Let me just do this right here. All right, first thing, the simplest KQL query is just the name of the table. There's every row in the customer's table, in every column. 
not filtered, not sorted in any way. It's just a natural order. Uh, if I want to filter, I use a where clause. So you see this has year to date sales here. Show me all those ones that uh, sales sales are more than a million. There they are right there. Um, we can sort them. Let's do it like this first. I can sort by year to date sales. It's actually kind of funny because if I remove that and run it, the default is actually descending order. I think it's the opposite in SQL. It's by default it's ascending order. So just I always explicitly put whether it's ascending or descending, so there's no confusion. All right, so now if I want to do a top end query here, I only want to say the top three sales. Show me the top three customers. Scott, Bill, and Jeff, they're, they can afford it. They're buying a bunch of stuff here from whatever it is that we're selling. Uh, this is the project. I only want certain columns right here, uh, but I can also do calculations inside of those columns. So for example, I've got a, let's go back up to customers here. I've got this last order date right here. I wanna project the, the, the full name and the last order date, and I want the next day. Maybe that's important to me because the last order date is uh, the day after the last order date is important information. Uh, Year-to-date sales is here, and the quota, if everybody's quota is $2 million, maybe I want to get uh, the remaining quota. How much do they have left that's to get to $2 million? So let's do that one right here. I'll just, I'll just do this here, and you can see these calculated columns. There's the last order date. There's one day later. There's the year-to-date sales. There's $2 million minus the year-to-date sales. And I can also use... Instead of just putting a calculation in here, what if I want to like use a calculation right here? So I can't really do this. Here I have uh, remaining quota times two. It would be nice if I could make that also here because I've got remaining quota here. Why not use that in another calculation? That, that won't work. However, what I can do is use the extent because the output of this now becomes the input of this. And tell me I want to create one more and I want to use this remaining quota, which I calculated before that. So now my expected sales are the remaining quarter times two, whatever that means. So this allows me to actually use calculated fields inside of calculated fields. Uh, and I guess I already did that. I don't really care about that. Yeah, so just extend last order day. Yeah, that's really the same thing. Um, and here's some here's an aggregation here. I want to do uh, simple aggregation by postal code. Where do I have it? I should keep going back up to here. Run. I have a postal code right here. And some of these are in the same postal code. So I want to aggregate count an average year-to-date sales by postal code. That's something that's really simple to do in SQL Server as well, but this is how it works in um, KQL. And I'm gonna guess that a lot of you folks are already familiar with SQL, but maybe less familiar with KQL, which was me when I started this. And that's why this is really awesome here. It, add dash, 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 and explain, and then just put some SQL syntax in there, and that will give you the equivalent KQL. This is a lifesaver. Look at that. This is the KQL equivalent of that right there. How cool is that? All right. Uh, I've been talking a lot. Let me just see if there's any questions. I think you have one question in chat about uh, why time series data specifically for uh, Cousteau. All right. So the question is why time series data specifically? I don't know the answer to that question. It's just that's what's optimized for. That's what it's used for. I mean, certainly it's a it's a common use case, particularly with IoT data or logs. This, I think it's really what uh, it's uh, most people are using it for. It's you want you have things that have a timestamp and you want to. Optimize that. And the question was, if uh, another question is, if data is updated frequently, is there any penalty for using materialized view? Yeah, there is a uh, performance hit. So data, there's a there's a time lag between when it's updated 
in the table versus when it's updated and materialized. Usually it's fast, usually it's a second or two, but you want to be aware of that, what's going on there. There's probably also, I mean, there it depends on your architecture, but there's probably going to be some, any kind of a massive data thing like this, there'll be some lag somewhere. In the IoT example, or even in, in logs, usually you're going to, you're going to, want to be able to handle huge loads, so you're going to put things into something like an event hub and then pull it in from the event hub. So that's that's kind of where, uh, uh, you know, you be aware of where, you know, I always say near real time, there's always going to be some sort of delay. And one of those delays of materialized views do take a finite amount of time to update. There's also, when you create a materialized view, if you create it against a large data set, then there's an option to include existing data or not include existing data. So let's say you create a materialized view against a table that already had 100,000 rows in it. You may then, if you include that data, it's going to take a while for those 100,000 rows to populate inside of the materialized view. And you may decide, though I don't really care about those 100,000 rows. I care about only things, only the things that are going forward. And that's a switch that you can do when you create a materialized view. All right, let me show you a couple other things here, time series data. So here's the drone data table that I populated earlier. I created and populated earlier. It has 26 records in it right here. And is a longitude, a latitude, and then I'm just tracking battery life as well. I want to know about that. And so right here, here I am uh, tracking um, the battery life of all these, and here, oh, here I'm using the pre function. I want to know what's the previous battery life right here. So if I do this, this is really cool. That function right here, of course, the first record, there was no previous battery life. Oh, I'm also doing, oh, and then I'm extending it. I want to know how much did it change. Now that I have the previous battery life, now I can do a calculation to say the battery life changes the current battery life minus the previous battery life. So it doesn't really make sense for the first row, but the second one, you say it went from 100 to 99 it changed by 0.1 it went this one went from 99.9 .9 to 99.8 it changed by 0.1 and this one this one didn't change at all this one changed by 0.1 and so on so that's this is really powerful stuff this would be hard to do in sql um let's see of course you have to do an order by it or for this to work uh, and here we're doing a, a summarize by bin right here. So here I want to summarize one record per hour. And even though there's a lot more than one record per hour, looks like they're at uh, 10 o'clock, 10, about every 15 minutes is a record here. So there should be about 25%. Here now, run that. And now I only get a few. It's just this is just for drone number one. Right here. This one is calculating the distance between two points. In this case, the two points are the longitude latitude of the current row and the longitude latitude of the previous row. So you can see, if I run this, how far they've gone. 1.69260, 1.6. And whatever, I, whatever uh, units I've used for my Latin long will be in here. All right, let's see what else I got here. Uh, here's the, I had this on the screen earlier. This code right here is for, to generate a polygon, a four-sided four polygon called polygon. And what I want to do is I want to just show any one of the drone data records that are inside of this polygon right here. So I use the geo point in polygon. I pass in the longitude and latitude of each of each record and I pass in the polygon and then I'll just order it by drone ID and timestamp. Let's run that. I get uh, these three recs. So zone two just kind of went into the polygon just for a second and came back out. Zone one was in for three points here between 10 and 11. All right. And this is doing a, oh, this is converting to S2 cells, just for drone one. I want to convert all the Latin long to S2 cells. I, I, for, I selected level 13 because that's the precision I care about. And it 
created this one right here. So I can see which ones these rows, a lot of these rows were in this particular S2 cell, but that's a different S2 cell. It moved from one S2 cell to another, and then moved to another one here, and stayed in that one. So it looks like there's about four different S2 cells. All right, and now that I've done that, let's bring this down a little bit here. Here now I've got, I'm defining my polygon again, right here, and I wanna say, Give me an array of S2 cells. It's the one that I have on the slide. Show me that array of S2 cells that will cover this polygon at level 12. The smallest number of cells that will cover the polygon at level 12. And uh, once I have this S2 array, then now I can just filter on that to say, just show me only those where the S2, see, first I want to calculate the S2 12 based on geopoints to S2 cells. And then I want to say, show me those that are actually in here. So that's that. And once I have that, then I'm going to filter it further. I'm not using functions here or materialized view. I'm just showing it in, in line. And then the, finally, I want to say, show me those that uh, I'm going to query. I'm going to query, rather than querying the entire table, I'm only going to query this view, this temporary view right here. All right, let's go ahead and run that. And this is this was lightning fast, but it's a small data set, so it's not really that impressive here. This is really gets impressive when you have hundreds of thousands of rows, millions of rows. Um, these are the points, the same points that are inside of that polygon. It just it ran a fraction of a second faster. All right, I'll create some materialized view here. Notice over here on the left we have the tables, but if I go and create a materialized view, here's the syntax here. Uh, this with backfill equals true means I don't want to, if I say backfill equals false, then it'll only consider, put put uh, records in the view that are created from this point going forward. With backfill equals true, it'll take the records right now. This is for customers, and I think there are like 10 customers or 12 customers. Um, it'll put all those in here. So this is something that you, you want to think about if you've got a huge amount of data. Do I really want to put them all in the view and wait hours for that view to populate? All right, so anyway, this is uh, this materialized view. It's um, querying on customers, and it's doing a summary by postal code with um, all the stuff about year-to-date sales, average, max, min, and the number of rows per postal code. So I can run that and look if, if I do that and refresh. I should see. Oh, here we go, right here. There's my materialized views right here, and I can do. I can actually double click that and it actually helps me to do this. I can run this right here and see there's my materialized view. It's aggregated by postal code. And if I want to so, show only those, I want to, I can filter it just as if it were a table. Show me only those with average sales over a million. These three zip codes is where all the rich kids live. They're spending a lot of money. I can change that materialized view using dot alter materialized view command. And in this case, uh, what am I doing here? I think I am, this is max and average, whereas that one was min, max, and average. Um, that's the difference. I don't, I don't really care anymore about this min sale. So I'm gonna alter that materialized view and run it. And now if I go up here, you'll see that there are, there's one less column, one fewer column. Okay, functions. Um, I showed you the syntax for creating a function, but I didn't really talk about the fact that there are two kinds of functions. There's a uh, scalar function and there's a tabular function. A scalar function returns a value, um, just a single value, whereas a tabular function actually returns a data set. So here's an example of a scalar function here. Uh, I pass in revenue and expenses and it just returns the difference between the two, revenue minus expenses. Let me go ahead and run that right here. Now I get this thing here, right here. Underneath that, I told to put it in the folder called samples. See right here, and there's there it is right here. There there's that, and then I can then I can use that function to say query the customers and show me the profit. Pass in the sales and the expenses, and there it is. It's it's, it's calculated that for me. You probably wouldn't use it for something that simple, but you can see that sometimes this is a useful thing if you have something. That's a lot, uh, requires a lot more calculation. 
And then with tabular functions, these don't return just a single scalar value, they return an entire data set. So in this case, I've got one called drone route and put it in the same folder right here. And this is going to uh, show me all of the drones for a given time period. That's what this is gonna do. So this drone route is, if I look at drone data, I wanna know those that are between here and here. I wanna summarize them by bin timestamp. By default, it'll be one hour. Sort it by timestamp. And I want to see the timestamp, longitude, latitude. So this right here, I'm just going to run that. That'll create the function. And now I can call that function right here like this. So if I have an aggregation that I'm doing over and over again, it might make sense just to create a function to do that. And let's see. And this is actually has an advantage. It's a disadvantage from the materialized view. Materialized view actually persists to disk. So that function, that, 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 that view is actually run ahead of time. And so it's really fast. The functions, they have to be run in real time, so they're, they're slower. However, the materialized view has to be, there has to be an aggregation in it, whereas a function doesn't have to have an aggregation. A materialized view will only work if you have to summarize it. All right, so there's this here, and I can call, call that here. Here I'm doing it by 30 minutes. If I don't pass in that fourth parameter, just assumes one hour. I get those rows. Uh, and then what else? Oh, well, I'll do some ingestion here. Uh, this is the, I'll create another table. I'll call it customers two. There's right now, right now there's no data in here. Customers two, see some intelligence pops up in the portal as well. No records in there, but if I ingest same data into customers two and query, that table again, now there are 10 records inside here. Uh, I can ingest from blob storage. This actually isn't set up yet, so I can't really run this demo, but I'll, I'll show this to you, is that if I have a blob that in, in my Azure storage account, then simply in, dot ingest into table, the table name, and then I pass in this blob, there's some key information here, and tell it the format of it, and that'll ingest it in from a blob. This is really nice if you want have a lot of data. Sometimes it makes sense to, uh, um, if you want to populate something, push it first into blob storage, and and then pull it into ADX. Though I don't have this blob set up yet, that's, that's why there's an XXX in there. But this happens to, it would take a CSV file. You would expect that CSV file to have the same schema as this right here, as the, the customer's three table does right here. And then the, let me see, I think I have one more demo I can show you. But first, back to my slides and see if I can. Uh, oh yeah, let me show you one more demo because there is, I was just playing with this today. If I go back to here, to my Azure portal, then what I did was, I'll show you this right here. So, um, next week I'm doing a presentation on monitoring in, um, in Azure, it includes a lot of app insights, application insights. So if you've worked with application insights in the past, then you can see that, uh, then you can configure application insights, or you can configure your application to log to application insights. Just like you could have it log to a, ta to a storage table or a console or whatever. And the way that I'm gonna do that, let's see, in my controller, right here is I've got code right here. So I've got a, I've configured it. I don't want to dive into this code really that, that much here because it's off topic, but I've got this I logger here and this is the same I logger you would use for any kind of logging in a .NET application. And it has a proper, has methods like log information, log warning, log error. And I, so I ran this and I pushed it into 
my application insights right here. And I have in here, I'm going to have to regenerate my keys now. And where is this? Well, under logs, I can query that. It all goes into a table called traces. So right here, if I do traces, order by timestamp descending, that should be good right here. It's not a whole lot. If there were a lot, I would add pipe take 100 right here. And I don't want to take 100 because let me actually, you know, there's, there's all sorts of automatic tracing that's going on. I'm going to have to run this to actually get some data in there. So let me go back to here and do a .net run. and run it. And this runs it on localhost 5294. So let me just grab that. I think I can control click on that. And that should open it up here. And if this right here, this is going to call that just logs. I'll refresh that a few times. It's just going to do a log error, log info, log warning right here. And this is the way that Application Insights is set up is it is an instant. It goes out, it gets queued because there's so many people logging to Application Insights that it goes into some kind of a queue and then it gets pushed to ADX. So if I go back to this query here and run it again, it's, it might take a minute or so before these show up in here. Um, I'll show you these. This is automatic tracing that's happening in every web app. So you can see some information is in here. It's just there happens to be a Git of the index page. And if I expand that, it shows me all kinds of information. So it's, yeah, you do have a schema here, but you can also have some kind of semi-structured information like this JSON right here. That you don't have to define in advance. So it's kind of a hybrid between SQL and NoSQL. Again, hopefully I'm in the right spot. And maybe I'm in the wrong did you test 0625. Oh, this is the right place. It's just taking a minute. And 1104. This is UTC time. So um, uh, this is not for I'm waiting for about six minutes after the hour. So when that record should show, oh, there it is. Okay, so here's the ones that I got just now. So it took a minute for it to show up inside of ADX because it had this asynchronous queuing that Application Insights puts in so it's in order to handle its heavy load. But you can see there, there's that information here that I logged uh, with an error message and extra information that I didn't even tell it about that it just by default, it knows that what, you know, which method fired this. It's really good for tracing for error handling you know for going back after the fact uh, this is a really common use case for it it's just doing logging so even if you don't ever use adx but you're using application insights you're still going to use kql so it's a good skill to have just like sql is a good skill to have for just about every developer uh the question was can data services in in azure consume data in these adx's uh, can ADX table, I would have to check that. I don't know if, uh, it's been a while since I've used Azure Data Factory. I would, I would not, I would be surprised if it's not available. Um, as an input, but I'd have to look at that. Okay, let me, Close this off before we go into Q&A. If you want to look now, let me, um, really, all you need is this link right here, which I am going to put into the uh, meeting notes for this right here. So how do I do that? Let's see, is there, isn't there a comment? Yeah, add a comment. My slides. There we go. HTTPS colon whack whack. 
Does that turn it into a hyperlink? It looks like it does not. Comet appears to contain spam. Oh, it doesn't even like hyperlinks. Yikes. How about that? I guess I can't do that. Well, I can put it into here, though. HTTPS right there. And this will take you to my slide deck. So right here, there's the PowerPoint deck I was showing. So it contains all these official documentation, a bunch of articles and videos that I wrote are here as a picture of it right there. Um, some marketing stuff, uh, the interview with the ADX team, which is kind of interesting. That's uh, for one of my shows that I did. And uh, you can get to all of that by just opening up these slides in that tiny URL I posted. All the demos are right here. Even the table creation scripts, those are right here as well. And thank you very much. Um, Dave, I think. Back to you, Sam. Did you cover the question about the um, consuming Azure? Uh, I'm sorry, consuming uh, data in these ADXs? I believe you did. And you mean from Azure Data Factory? I don't really know the answer to that question. If you want to, we could just go into Azure and uh, try. I don't think I have an Azure Data Factory. But if I do Data Factory here, I can't remember how how long it takes to actually create an Azure Data Factory. But there's a GUI in here. Review and create. Some of these services just take a few seconds. Some of them take minutes. But there is a connection string associated with a uh, an ADX cluster, which suggests to me that you should be able to connect to it from just about anything. You can certainly write .NET code or Java code, connect to it that way. So I don't see why you wouldn't be able to do this. And I need to launch the studio here. And I want to ingest Oh, it's been a long time since I've used this. Source type. There it is, right there. Need a new connection. Description. Right there. Cluster, right there. Uh, what do I need for this? Uh, I need some information here, but yes, you can. There, that's the answer. Okay, very good. That's sufficient um, answers the question if we don't go over all the demo. One other question for you. Yeah. Uh, what about replication? If you mentioned that uh, with ADX it handles uh, mass amounts of data, what about replicating it to other data centers and what's the latency as far as that goes? I don't, I, I don't know what the latency is, but I, I can tell you that when you create it, and probably will after, probably even after you create it. How do I get over here? In here, then, uh, well, when you, when you create this one here, if I go back to here and say create a resource, one of the options is replication to other regions here. So here, cluster, we're going to select a workload, availability zones right here. And so that does replication automatically for you if you turn it on. As you can see, it's turned off by default, and there is a cost to that. But I don't know what the, uh, the latency is when you do that. Okay. Maybe in your center. That's all it does. And there's probably okay. a way to um, change that setting. Availability. I'm guessing there's a way in here somewhere to change it after the fact.
but I don't see it. That one. Okay. I appreciate you looking. Uh, does anyone else have any questions for David or comments? Going once, <laughs> twice. All right, before we wrap it up, I uh, just have a couple of wrap up announcements. Uh, so first of all, thank you again, David. Uh, very informative presentation. Uh, learned a lot and I'm sure a lot of others have as well. I, um, I posted several links into the, the chat window and we'll be covering those in just a little bit. And let me go ahead and share my screen if I may. Of course. All right, there we go. So for tonight's resources, as you know, the presentation is being recorded. Uh, it'll be edited in a few short days and then uploaded to YouTube. Uh, the link is posted in the chat. So if you would please subscribe to the channel and you'll get upload notifications. And along those lines, the tech events that we'll cover in just a little bit are also posted on my blog. And likewise, you can subscribe to that to get updates as things are posted. And last but not least is the feedback evaluation. The link for that is also in chat. Uh, if you would please take a moment to fill that out so we can provide David with uh, some constructive criticism. If you joined us after the start of the meeting, I uh, wanted to mention a special offer from Manning.com, 35% off with the discount code MTPCLEC21. And the link for that is also posted in chat. And some upcoming events for user groups on July 19th. Whoops, passed up that slide. Once again, uh, for tech events coming up uh, later this month, the Akron Women in Tech, uh, that's going to be meeting online, and that's on July 19th. Uh, on July 20th is the Great Lakes User Group uh, for .NET, or also known as glug.net, and they meet online as well, and that happens every third Thursday of the month. And then on the, the fourth Thursday is the Cleveland C-Sharp User Group meeting, and for that we're going to have April Dunham discussing Power Apps. Uh, April uh, works on the Power Apps team with Microsoft, and she'll be providing an overview of Power Apps. As far as conferences, on July 15th, which is this coming Saturday, is SQL Saturday Columbus. And if you're not familiar with SQL Saturday, that is basically an all-day event of SQL Server topics. And there you see uh, in the browser the schedule that's going to be happening for this Saturday. Variety of topics related to all things uh, data related, uh, both SQL Server, uh, Azure Data, and then other uh, frameworks as well, or other databases as well. It's a free event. Uh, it's, it's held in person in Columbus, Ohio, so I strongly encourage you to, to attend. Uh, it's always a great event, and you can't beat free of charge by meeting all these experts. Some job openings. Tech Systems always has some job openings available at techsystems.com slash IT dash jobs. But I always like to ask who's hiring and who's looking for work. Uh, if you would please yeah, either enter it in chat or speak up verbally. And so far, nothing in chat. David, is Microsoft hiring? Microsoft is always hiring. If you want to uh, explore, then you go to careers.microsoft.com, and you can filter and save your filter and get an email every week and find out about you know what positions are available. Um, we did have some layoffs recently, so I just want to temper expectations. Um, Understandable. I'm still here. Well, I'm left with nothing but survivor skills. But, uh... <laughs> Last but not least, my contact information, uh, SNASR at NIS Technologies, if there's anything I can answer for you. Uh, also, you can find me on Twitter, at Sam Nasser. Uh, my blog, as I mentioned earlier. And then, if we're not connected on LinkedIn, I invite you to do so. And with that, concludes our uh, July meeting. So thanks again to David. Thank and you. thank you all for attending, and uh, look forward to seeing you all next month.